Okay, lesson 41, simple linear regression. So we're going to talk about making inference with these lines that we fit, as well as talking about residuals and checking uh, conditions in order to in order to fit a line and say, hey, this is reliable, there are conditions we have to meet. Pretty much any statistical analysis we do, if it's hypothesis testing, confidence intervals, that kind of thing, we are going to have conditions that say it's okay to do this method when you have this scenario. So least squares regression is going to, uh, the line will be appropriate when we have specific conditions. So first we're going to talk about the population line. So the least square regression line, remember I mentioned there's a y hat. Anytime you see a hat, know that it's estimated using sample data. So we're saying, hey, the equation of this line, y hat, is estimated to be, um, B, B naught is our estimate for the, the y-intercept plus B1 is the, uh, the estimate for the slope times our explanatory variable. That is going to be our estimated line equation for some population equation. The idea behind the population equation is if I had all data points in the entire population and fit a master line to all of those data points, I'm going to have mu of y, so the mean of y is equal to, and notice we've switched over to Greek letters because they're parameters. So beta naught is the um, y-intercept for, well, actually it's probably further out over here, for all, um, for all um, students at this small college, and then plus beta 1 times x. So if we had the entire population at hand, the least square regression line we calculate from that would give us a population line. Usually we don't, so what we do is we take a sample and estimate that line from our sample. So here, the true population regression equation, so when they took all the individuals at this small college, took their high school graduating GPA and their, um, their uh, first year college GPA, this was the equation of the line fit to, to these data. When we took a sample of just 10 of them, the predicted line we got, so remember, so this was 0.67 plus 0.77 times high school GPA. So we got the predicted uh, college GPA is 0.69 plus 0.78 times high school GPA, which is not extremely far off from, from the, uh, from the true population line, which is which is good. You want it as close to that true population line as you can get. Most of the time, we are not going to be fortunate enough to know what that true population line is. What we, we really need to count on is that we did have a representative sample. Um, shocker, we're still going to want a representative sample. Usually the easiest way is to get a random sample. So yeah, arrows. So yeah, the, this red line is this equation. This blue line is that equation. So when I have the entire population data, so I have high school GPA and college GPA for all students at this small college, and I fit a line that's simultaneously as close to all of those points at once, this is my line. Then I can go ahead, I, I can estimate for a student that had a high school GPA of 3.4 on um, what is the average um, college GPA for all high school GPAs of 3.4. So plug it in, so 3.29 is, is the average um, college GPA for all students that had a 3.4 in high school. So things to note, they still have some variability, right? If you look at 3.4, oh man, purple on purple, sorry. They did not all have exactly that 3.29, right? There's some variability because people vary, right? Not every student that had a 3.4 in high school actually got a 3.29 in, in college. That's just on average, that's what they got. So we need to try and figure out, well, how much does that vary? So looking here, 
we are going to take a slice. If we were to cut it here, sorry, that purple on purple, uh, 3.29 represents the average GPA for all students with a high school GPA of 3.4. Uh, and then we have some spread. So there's some way if we took this slice, we could describe how spread out from the line that those points are. And typically like what we're going to do moving forward with um, with uh, least squares regression, we're going to need the points to be roughly uh, normally distributed around that line. So we need them densest close to the line and then further out to be less dense. They need to be normal or approximately normal here. Okay. So here, this is just kind of showing that slicing. So if I were to slice anywhere in this, in this scatter plot, the idea is the spread should be around the line should be roughly the same. So if I took a slice at at high school GPA is a 3.4 and saw the, the spread around that line, it should be roughly the same as the spread around the line at, for high school GPAs of 3.5 or 3.6, that kind of thing. So it's the idea that anywhere you go on this line, the points are densest really close to the line, they're less dense further away, it's roughly normally distributed um, for each slice. So knowing this allows us to put together this, this line equation here. So this is our, our, uh, our line, um, or if we take the average, we're going to go ahead. And this is our population line right here. So the expected value of y. So however much y varies around this line is equal to how much these things vary. So your y, your, um, so your y-intercept, hopefully that's not varying too much. Um, it's your, your error. So error is how much it's fluctuating around that line. So what we need in order for the least squares regression line equation to work and be effective um, as, a, as a, a prediction model, we need these four assumptions to be true. We want, if we fit a line to the data, we want the data to have a linear relationship. And I know that sounds kind of like duh, but it's actually really, really important. You don't want to fit a line to something that's curved. The variability is constant, so that means that wherever I slice it, the, the variability is roughly the same. We do have a, a graph or a plot that we look at for this. The, also, the uh, response varies normally. We do have a fourth one, it's independence, um, and we'll talk about that as well. Um, so the idea is if I were to take slices anywhere, the points are densest right near the line, further away from the line, they're, they're less dense. So model variability. We don't know for the population how much it varies on average from, from that population line, but we can estimate it. So in the population, we have this population line, we can estimate how far the points vary from that line on average. In general, so as that variability decreases, that means the points get tighter and tighter closer to the line. This is good. The tighter the points are to the line, the better the line is at making predictions. We don't like it when the variability is high because that means you have your line and the points are really just all over the place around the line. We don't really like that. Sometimes you can't do anything about it, but it's really rough. Um, it makes it really hard to have dependable predictions when your points are all over the place. So over here, for our sample data, we can estimate this, this variance around the line. So how much does the response vary on average for the entire population with our mean squared error. So this is something that hopefully should look familiar. If you run like an ANOVA table, you'll get a mean squared error here. S squared um, is an estimate here for sigma squared. So here S squared is our sum of squared errors over our sample size minus the number of explanatory variables plus one. So here, um, college uh, GPA and high school GPA 
n was 10, k was 1. I know this sounds weird, but um, we had one explanatory variable, high school GPA. So k was 1. So we're going to look at SSE here over 10 minus 1 plus 1. So 10 minus 2, we would have our sum of squared errors over 8. We're not going to calculate the sum of squared errors oh, um, by hand, but just know that 8, eight, eight would be our, our we're going to get to it, degrees of freedom here. So this would be our, our, our estimate here. A lot of times you can pull up, um, there are, is code that you can run this linear model and it can give you all of these, um, the, your estimates for the, the slopes and what, um, the slope and the intercept. You can also uh, get an ANOVA table from it and pull the sum of squared errors out of that, which is super useful. Super tied to it. The big difference between what we were doing a couple of weeks ago with the single factor ANOVA was a single factor ANOVA, we had a quantitative response and a categorical explanatory. Now it's just switched over so that we have a, a quantitative response and a quantitative uh, explanatory. So residuals, so no matter what, unless your line fits perfectly, some points fit, miss the line, right? So you want to calculate like how far, like how, how much is it, are the points missing the line? That these distances, these are our residuals. So it's going to be, so whatever you actually observed, so observation one, so high um, student one, whatever their, um, their college GPA is, minus the predicted GPA. So when you plug in their high school GPA into the, the least square regression line, that predicted college GPA, we want to know how far apart what they actually got in college is from what the line predicted it would be. That is what we're looking at. It is very specifically what we observed in the sample minus what was predicted. So you do not want to mix up the order. It will flip the sign and it kind of goes sideways sometimes. So for here, residuals are actually extremely important. They're really um, useful in, in uh, especially looking at conditions. So here, like I said, it's the, that space that missed. You had this point where, where it is on the line. That's what was predicted by the line. This gap is our residual. It's how much the line missed by. So we minimize these squared residuals in order to obtain the line. They definitely, they help us determine how well our model fits. So we fit this line to these data. How well does this line fit? And it helps give us an idea of that. And uh, we are absolutely, we use it to help us estimate the, the standard deviation of, of that true population line or the variance of that true population line. So why are residuals important? So for example, we have th these data here. They're gathered on, we have number of credits a student is taking and their exam score. And I'm assuming it's out of 100. And we wanna go ahead and predict the exam score um, using the number of credits that they're taking. So looking here, we wanna say, hey, is this a linear relationship? Would it be reasonable? And just looking here, yeah, maybe, it's kind of weird though, right? Because everything is here, but look at the scale, right? It goes from zero to a hundred, even though everything's between 60 and 80. So when you're this zoomed out, yeah, I would say this looks roughly like a line. So next step, we fit the line and we pull up our residual plots. So before the scale, definitely it was very, very deceptive on the last one. So even though I may have thought it looked linear, when you zoom way in, it apparently isn't. So here's my residual plot. So what they do is they take all the differences from each point in the line and they make it, they magnify, they make it bigger, easier to see. So looking here, I have this curve shape. If you see a curve shape in the residuals plot, this indicates that a line wasn't appropriate. It means that you should have fit a curve. So if you see a curve, it means, oops, you fit a line when you should have fit a curve. So what that gets at is it's hard to see here. 
but I, sh I should have fit a curve here. That's what it's saying, that a line was not appropriate because it's a curve. Although, to be honest, this is a very small data set, so it's really hard to tell. So absolutely, really, really important to have access to those residuals there. So here, we're going to go ahead, we're going to calculate a residual here. For the student, that corresponds to the point um, 3.6, 3.3. So we have a student with a high school GPA. Sorry, I'm like getting further from the mic. Um, oops. High school GPA of 3.6 and a college GPA of 3.3. So if I look here, this student, I want to know how much did our, our line miss um, predicting their, their actual college GPA? Because right here, this is where the line predicted they'd be, but this is where they were. So we want to compare. So looking here, so you want your residuals going to be what you observed minus predicted. So here, what I observed, I observed they got a 3.3. That's what was observed. Y hat, so if I want that, I'm just going to say, okay, well, 0.69 plus 0.78x. Specifically, I want to know the high, it was a high school GPA of 3.6. Plug in, we did this one earlier, I believe. It's a 3.498. Let me double check. Because I'm decent at math, but that's not necessarily math I'm good at doing in my head. Okay, so what we're getting at is the student actually, so y minus y hat, they actually got a 3.3, that's what we observed in real life, minus what the line predicted they would get since they had a 3.6 in high school. The line predicted they would get a 3.498, so the line over predicted. Line over predicted. It predicted they'd get a higher GPA than they really did get. And I get what negative 0.198. So I I definitely it 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 over it overestimated what they 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 would get. So looking here, 3.6. It, it's comparing this distance. That's my residual. This is my residual plot. So if however many observations I have, that's how many residuals I have because every single point in the data set gets its own residual. So I have 10 observations in my GPA data set. I'm going to have 10 residuals. Every student gets their own residual. So looking here, high school GPA, 3.6. There's my student right there. And look right there, it's my residual. And where it lines up, it's going to be that negative 0.198. So it's really close to that negative 0.2. So that, that's where that is. So my residual plots, you are going to have a scatter plot of all n residuals. So here are my x values, my y values. These are my y hat. So this is what we actually observed. This is what we predicted would happen. I go ahead, I subtract, and I get my residual. So my residual is y minus y hat. So there are a number of ways. So the y-axis is going to be the value of the residual. And usually we hope that it's centered around zero because on average, if your line does well, um, they should be close to zero, right? If your line does well, that the point shouldn't be off. Um, they shouldn't always be above the line and they shouldn't always be below the line. Um, you can have your explanatory, you can have your response uh, variable as some ordered index. You can really, really change it up what's on the y, on the x-axis. So y-axis, oops, at zero. 
So x-axis, but the y-axis is the residuals. So that's going to be consistent. And then you're going to, you can put uh, whatever pretty much on that, that horizontal axis. It could be your explanatory variable, your y variable, an index. It helps us assess how, so we fit this line to these data, how well does that line fit? It helps us check the conditions. So if we fit a line, we need to know that fitting a line was appropriate and that using this line for inferences is appropriate because if we violated conditions, we should not use this uh, to make predictions. And if your line does a good job, you want random scatter around zero because on average, if your line is doing well, you'll have some that are below, some that are above. Um, on average, they'll be zero. It's really bad news if all of your residuals are above and all, or all of them are below, because that means your line consistently underestimates or consistently overestimates, and that's a problem. So here's our college GPA here, I example. Uh, so here's my residual plot. So I have 10 students, so I have 10 residuals. So each student has their own residual. So looking here, it looks pretty decent. It looks like random scatter. This is that outlier that that one student who um, had that 3.3 that GPA in high school, um, and they, uh, they did a bit better in, in their first year of college than the line predicted they would do. But beyond that, that one outlier, it's not that extreme. It's kind of nice even, this is good. We want nice random scatter. Random scatter is good here. Patterns are bad. So patterns we don't like. Random scatter we love. Oops. So conditions for inference. So I reordered them this way just for funds, um, I believe. So we went ahead, uh, said that we need to, to meet these conditions. So first one, L for linearity, right? So linear, you need to have evidence that the relationship is linear because if you fit a line to it and it's not linear, what are you doing, right? I know that sounds really like basic, but you don't want to fit a line to something curved. Uh, I for independence, so you want the observations to be independent. This mostly is going to depend on your um, on on the context of your problem. So examples when this may not happen, like if you have households of people or you have litters of, of pigs and um, siblings are more likely to be similar to one another. So you need observations that are independent from one another. You can't have them be related to, to each other or paired in some way. Um, there are plots that you could look at. We're not going to go into order time plots, but that's one thing. But mostly it's going to be context of the problem. You need to be able to reason, yeah, these will be independent observations. And then N for normality. So if I were to basically slice the, uh, the, uh, the scatter plot anywhere on this line, the points fit around that line roughly normally. Uh, so they're densest really close to the line and they're less dense further away. We do have a special plot that we use with the residuals to look at this. So don't worry, it's not all about looking at this and saying, oh yeah, that looks normal. It's actually really hard to just look at it and tell. And then this one, so constant variance or constant standard deviation. So how much it varies or, or, or spread is constant. Um, I threw them in this order, L, I, N, C, because I thought it was funny. We're in link building, although we're not because, you know, remote remote learning. So, but the idea here is if I were to slice it anywhere, the spread is roughly the same. You do not want to have a data set that's like this and then, because the idea is the line is horrible at predicting here and excellent at predicting there. You want the line to be consistently good at making predictions. So you don't want it like really spread out in some places and then really, really compact in others. That's a problem. So we have plots for all of these. Independence, primarily, we won't be looking at plots. You'll be looking at the, uh, the, the description of the problem. So here, here's all four of them, that linearity. 
So you would look at this residuals plot and go, hey, do I see curves? Or so if you see like a, a curvature or if you saw, if you had a, this in your residuals plot, that would be a huge red flag. Like, oh, I did not. I, I, I fit a, a line, not a curve. This is bad. So if you see that kind of pattern um, in, in, in your, your residuals plot, your assumption or condition of linearity is probably violated. Independence, it's definitely the trickier one. There's not one set way to, to figure out if there is independence. It's going to come down to you have to read the question prompt and determine is it reasonable to assume the observations are independent. There is time series data, order plots, or residuals. You also, there's spatial things could be related to each other spatially. What that means is um, observations that are closer together in time or space, like location, like maybe you might have plots, um, are more similar to each other than the ones that are further away. Um, so in that scenario, you might want to consider a different type of analysis. It goes way beyond the scope of this class, uh, time series or spatial analysis, totally, totally beyond this. Uh, normality. So the the most common way that we look at this, we have a normal QQ plot. So it has a plot and the, I think I introduced this just a little bit when we were doing T methods, um, introducing them. The better the points fit the line, the more roughly normal it is. It's when you start getting into things that are like really far away, like if your residuals are like like that, that's bad. Like you don't want to see like weird um, alternating on that line. And then the last one here, constant variance slash standard deviation. If you have constant variance, you have constant standard deviation. We don't care which one you call it. Basically, the spread is constant throughout is the idea. And you're going to want to look at, if you're looking at, um, you, if you're looking at the residual spot, you want it to be fairly evenly fanned out. You don't want it to go like that. That would be bad. We don't like uh, uh, fanning out or funneling in or combos. That's bad news. So interpreting. So here's what I was talking about, fanning in, fanning out, as well as the curvature. So ooh, it looks a little small. So here we have a data set. We fit a line to it. I mean, it looks fairly reasonable, but if you go ahead and plot the residuals uh, plot, you have this big old curve. What it's saying is, no, don't fit that line. You need a curve. Obviously better than the one I just doodled, but this says, no, don't fit a line. A line's not good enough. Then similar, if I'm worried about constant variance, if you look here, the line is a lot better for making predictions here and a lot less great at making predictions over here. So you want your line to be consistently good. You want your line to be just as good at making predictions here as here. So when you plot your residuals plot, you get this fanning out. Oops. So if you get fanning out, funneling in, I mean, all sorts of things. You can have... Um, what did my teacher call this? The football. So it goes like that. Like it, it fans out and then funnels in. If you get the, um, the bow tie, that's not good either. Any combination. So if it's not fairly constant all the way through, that makes us sad. That would be bad. So if you see these patterns, this is an indication that, hey, you probably shouldn't, you know, use your line. Uh, to make to make predictions here, they aren't reliable. Um, if, if you violated these, your line is not reliable to make predictions. So checking here, still the high school GPA example. So here's our residuals plot. Um, we want to say, hey, are our conditions met? Uh, is it reasonable that we use the, the this uh, this line, this blue line that we we calculated here? So here, yes, there is an outlier. It's not super extreme here, but I would say the spread is fairly constant throughout. So 
I would argue that yes, there is random scatter. I would not argue that there's really a curve. Um, so I, I'm not too worried about the linearity assumption. I don't see big old fanning in or fun, fun, funneling in or fanning out. It would be way more useful if there were more observations. It's not the answer here, but it would be a lot more useful. So yes, there is random scatter. It, it looks approximately random. Roughly half the residuals are above zero, roughly half are below. There's not one distinct pattern in there. I feel okay moving forward. So then we have a few residuals plots here. So this one, take a look at it, maybe press pause. Um, but the question is, this is a residuals plot. Uh, are the conditions met? So hopefully, one thing you noticed was maybe a shape. It looks like this. The second that one of them's violated, I would say, no, um, linearity is violated. You might be able to argue the constant variance as well. It looks like you have more variation out here and less out here. But quite honestly, if you tell me, hey, the linearity is violated, we're pretty much going to say, oh, don't use this line. If any of them are violated, you're not going to really want to use the line. Note, though, if they are violated in an assignment, chances are we still will want you to move forward. But in real life, you really would not want to move forward and use this line to make inferences about the population. That would be bad news. Okay, so we're on the lesson 42. So now we're going to specifically look at estimating the slope. So we got the estimate, uh, the point estimate for, well, for the line. Uh, but now we might actually estimate like, hey, the slope we estimate is between this value and this value, that kind of idea. So we'll use T procedures for estimating a slope. And that is coming up next.